I usually start with introducing myself, but I want to start by introducing our wonderful tech people. Uh, Truman, who's over here, Truman Wynn, who's fantastic. Uh, library services, technology for uh, all the libraries here in Georgetown County. Fantastic job that he does and has made possible a lot for us as we've gone through these past two years and looking at creative ways by which we continue to offer our programs technologically and uh, just really glad to have him as part of a team and a good friend. And then Aaron's back here and Aaron is uh, doing the videoing and uh, that's also been a tremendous success for us uh, because although our numbers have been smaller than pre-COVID as far as turnouts for the presentations, nevertheless, we're averaging 75 to 125 people watching in on the YouTube presentations afterwards. And so that's actually a larger crowd than we had in the past, which gives us great opportunity to be able to present these wonderful programs in the Tuesdays with series. Around to myself, I'm Bob Willie, and I've had the privilege over the last five years to serve as president of the Friends of the Georgetown Library. And I say it's a privilege because it's a fantastic library here in Georgetown and an incredible staff. And it's not just because some of them are sitting here, but I would say it behind their backs too. They really do a great, great job of serving this community and wonderful diversity, diversity of the community, diversity of programs that are being offered. And they just do a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, I, the Friends of the Library for these past five years has had a lecture series called Tuesdays With. It's based on the uh, book, best-selling book in 1997 by, um, I just lost his name, but it's Tuesdays with Maury. Yeah, you all are saying the title, the author, thank you. Uh, Tuesdays with Maury, which is a wonderful book on the relationship between a professor and a student long after the student has graduated from college with the idea that our education continues beyond that formal stage of a high school or a bachelor's or a master's or a doctorate but goes on many, many years after that, which is exactly what this series is about to continue learning, uh, particularly about our community and to get to know Georgetown, Georgetown County better. And that's what we've been doing in our series over this past five years. So today we are privileged uh, to have with us Joy Bonds, uh, who is doing a presentation on life and times of James Boley. And as I put in the announcement for this, a very, very important person in the history of Georgetown and our nation in a lot of significant ways, not only in himself, but also in his connections. I will stop there so I don't steal any more thunder. Oh, <laughs> but in having this, we're also privileged to have with us Tina Wyatt, who is joining us from Washington, D.C., a connection that Joy has made. Uh, Tina will just give one little bit and then more intro later on, uh, is a direct descendant of Harriet Tubman who plays a very significant role in James's life. Uh, as I give an introduction for uh, Joy, a uh, native of Georgetown, graduated from Claflin University with a BS in biology, University of Phoenix with a master's degree in education, and has done post-master's work at Oxford College in Boston, Massachusetts. She has taught high school science for 18 years, 18 years, got the year, years number right, currently teaching at Georgetown High School, where she was named Georgetown County School District Teacher of the Year in 2011-2012. We are blessed, and the students are blessed. She is Regional Director of the South Carolina Science Council, member of Alpha Kappa, Kappa Alpha Sorority, where she serves on the Education and Arts Committees, and she is married to Dedrick, Nice to have, I, I go to Winnie Auditorium and he introduces me there, so I'm gonna get even. <laughs> Dedrick Bonds, who is a good friend also and has spoken last year, a wonderful presentation then. And uh, together they have seven children, which prevented them from celebrating Valentine's Day. <laughs> so we are, we, are their, we are their Valentine celebration today. <laughs> Anyway, so it's my privilege to introduce Leona Joy Bonds. Welcome. <laughs> I'll let you figure out all the technology. <laughs> Good morning, Ms. Wyatt. I've actually never saw you in person. Good morning, Joy. How are you? I'm great. All is well. I'm going to be on the side podium, so you probably won't be able to see me, but I think you can hear me, correct? I can hear you, yes. Okay, all right. 
So good morning to everyone. I do want to make a slight correction. I was not the district teacher of the year. I was just Georgetown High's teacher of the year. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> I want to make, make that correction. Okay. So as he said, I am Leona Joy Bonds, and I am honored to be standing in front of you today. Um, before I go any further, I must acknowledge a few folks. First, I'd like to recognize my husband, Dedrick. This is a first for me. Uh, he has encouraged me every step of the way. And y'all, honestly, this is really his arena, absolutely his arena. And I'm normally the person sitting right there smiling and nodding and listening, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm not sure if I got jealous, <laughs> but the shoe was on the other foot and Dedrick, your support means everything. So I thank you for that. Um, next, Mrs. McQueen actually is not here just yet. She texted me, but she is really the reason we made the connection with Ms. Wyatt. Mrs. McQueen runs a, a community newspaper, a magazine and radio show in Conway. And y'all, she like showed up at George Shanghai one day. There was like a person's in the office for you. And I'm like, okay. And it was her. And she told me she found out I was doing this by the library flyer. She contacted Mrs. McQueen and set up the whole thing. So when she comes in, we definitely want to thank her because she's the reason that we have the connection with Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Wyatt. Uh, Mr. Bob Willie, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, this kind of all started as me picking up a book and finding interest in a topic. And finally, Ms. Wyatt, if you can still hear me, I want to say thank you. You had no hesitation when approached about taking a part in this conversation. And as a side note, I want to tell you that I got tickled when I heard you say Aunt Harriet. That was amazing. Yeah. Well, she is my aunt. She is your aunt. That's right. <laughs> All right. So let me go back to how I ended up here. As he said, in my everyday life, I'm a science teacher, and I just happen to be the person who does the diversity celebrations at Georgetown High School. And so I was prepping for Black History Month, and I picked up a book by Mr. Steve Williams, who, um, and it's as I travel along, the story of Harriet Tubman and James Bowley, and I was trying to find some things to present to the students at Georgetown High School. Um, this book is illustrated beautifully by the Georgetown native, Mr. Alan Dennison, and translated into Gullah, a beautiful language that many of us speak and understand, by Miss Gloria Barr Ford. After reading the book, I took a liking to the story, and just like our treasured piece of history with Mr. Joseph H. Rainey, we are literally letting this little known piece of history slip through our fingers. So Mr. Williams, Mr. Dennison, and Ms. Barford, I thank you for lighting my spark. So I'm gonna really give just a really quick snippet of history about James because we wanna get to our conversation with Ms. Wyatt. She's basically the living, piece of our history here. So in 1844, he was born. And in 1850, he was six years old and his sister and his mother escaped from slavery, um, being the very first passengers on the Underground Railroad, being rescued by their Aunt Harriet. They basically devised a plan with James's dad and he kind of dressed up and tricked whomever at the slave market and bought his family. And then before he got caught, they escaped to freedom. So he was six years old in 1850. And then in 1863, he joined the Union Army at 19. And then by 1867, he really returned to Georgetown, South Carolina. And he was a teacher in the Freedmen's Bureau. So it was funny that by 23, they were saying that this at this point was the second phase of his life. I have a 23-year-old son, and y'all, he's not in her first phase of his life. I'm serious. So this man did a lot by 23, all right? So in, 20, uh, in 1869, he was elected to the SC House of Representatives via a special election. Um, someone by the name of Henry Webb died, and it opened up a seat. And as a side note, amazingly, Joseph Rainey was the current state senator at the same exact time that this was going on. Um, James ran as a radical Republican, and I thought it was amazing. If you look at the votes on the screen, there were 1,100 votes given to um, James Boley of the 1,275 votes that were casted. So he like swept that joke, right? And uh, E.L. Rainey actually ran, who was 
Joseph Serrini's brother as an opponent. So that was amazing. All right. And he was 25 years old, 25, his second phase of life at 25. He also got married to a Georgetown native. It said her name was Laura C. I did not see a last name. Um, they labeled her as a mulatto woman. Clark. Clark, thank you. Thank you, Laura Clark. And they labeled her as a mulatto woman. And um, that was 1870, so I guess he was 26. <laughs> um, he owned property and lived among both races. And as we know, his home is located on, King, on the corner of King and High Market. And it was a very special group of people that worked really, really hard and got a, a historical marker placed. And there was a big celebration and presentation there. Um, and then he was also reelected in 1870 and 1872 um, as a state representative, and he actually chaired the Ways and Means Committee um, while serving in the House. Now, so we can actually get to the conversation with Ms. Wyatt, I will briefly mention a few accomplishments. Between 1870 and his death, he had many, many, many more accomplishments. He became a lawyer and a judge. It is said that he studied, studied under Macon B. Allen, who was the first African-American lawyer in the United States. It is also said that he is the Sef Joseph, mm -mm, sorry, James is the second African-American to appear in a court in Georgetown. He started his own paper, and according to the book, it was called The Georgetown Planet, and this is the book, y'all should check it out. It's, I honestly thought it was the children's book until I started reading it, because I saw the cover. But I absolutely loved it. And then it has an activity book to go with it, guys. So y'all should check it out. And I'm pretty sure the library has copies, I think. Um, so the Georgetown Planet, while it was short-lived, it was a huge feat for an African-American at that time to start their own paper um, and actually have an audience. I read that it was about 500 subscribers to his paper, and I think it lasted like six months or so. Um, he served on the board of trustees for the University of South Carolina, another amazing feat for that time. He opened the doors for blacks to attend the University of South Carolina, a very beloved institution of our state, and our Jew in Georgetown was the person that led the way for African Americans to attend. Um, he started a bank, a Union Bank, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then the list can just go on. Again, he became the commissioner of schools, et cetera. Um, so this was really just a brief look at his life, and I feel that there's so much more that should be uncovered. Georgetown is absolutely full of rich history that has an impact well beyond our county's borders. Um, so now I'm going to get ready to bring on the main ordeal here, Miss Ernestine Tina Wyatt. Do you prefer Ernestine or Tina? Tina. Tina, Miss Tina Wyatt. Um, she is a descendant, as we have said, of James Bowley and Harriet Tubman. So Miss Wyatt, we thank you for being here. Um, so I'm just gonna first ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your relationship to James and Harriet. Well, thank you. Uh, Bob and thank you, Leona, for or Joy, <laughs> for Joy, um, right. <laughs> and the friends of Georgetown Library uh, for inviting me to come down and share, you know, a little bit of this history. And uh, also, I want to thank Joella McQueen, who has a heart for uh, African American history, and that uh, it is something that not only our culture needs to know what all cultures need to know and understand uh, so that we know and can, you know, uh, understand other people and what they've gone through and, uh, and things like that. So because everything, what impacts one person, one culture uh, impacts everyone at some point in time. Uh, so with that said, um, I, I like what you said when you, you talked about you were tickled, uh, <laughs> uh, Leona, that um, about me calling her on Harriet. And I'll just tell you briefly a little story about that. Um, I am, uh, as I said, I'm three times great descendant 
or three times great, great, great grandniece of Harriet Ross Tubman. She was the sister of my great, great, great grandmother, Soph. Okay. Soph is one of the sisters that was sold off. Lina is the mother of Kasaya. And Kasaya is the mother of James. So James would be a cousin mm -hmm. uh, in that relationship to me. Um, the thing is, is that when my mother left her hometown of Auburn, New York, she moved to Buffalo, New York, which is only about um, two to three hours away, mostly around two and a half hours. And we visited often, like every other weekend uh, we were there and during the summers. And I spent summers with my grandmother. Um, so whenever we would go there, though, my grandmother would always say, let's go visit Aunt Harriet. Mm -hmm. So what that meant was we were going to the home. We were going to visit the home. We were going to go to the cemetery. And we were going to do this ritual all the time. Mm -hmm. But I would think as a child, I would say, why are you calling her Aunt Harriet? Because my mother called her Aunt Harriet too. Why are you calling her Aunt Harriet? You don't know her. You know, she's dead. She's long been gone. And, but what I came to learn as, a, as an adult, because my grandmother always felt like, you know, children, you didn't say certain things to children or whatever. And then also they didn't talk a lot about, why things happened um, because it was too painful. So when I finally found out my grandmother was talking about Aunt Harriet one day and she said she knew her, that Aunt Harriet took care of her and would take her around with her when she was uh, working and doing things, took care of her while her mother worked alongside of her uh, in the home as, as, as a matron to the, in the John Brown home. And, um, or was it, I think it's the home, home for the, um, uh, people, the, the, the people that did not have a home, things like that. So one of them, but my grandmother, you know, told me that. And then I realized, I said, oh, Okay, well, you did know her. That's why you call her Aunt Harriet. <laughs> and so, but for me, she didn't become Aunt Harriet for me, even though I knew about her. Because when you say aunt, you know, I don't feel, it's not just a word, especially right. for someone who is, who is no longer with us. It's, uh, it's a term of endearment and affection, uh, of knowledge. And I feel like, I don't know, I just don't know about her. I have knowledge of her. And for me, my knowledge, my contact with her, my inspiration, among other things, mostly was about her faith. Mm -hmm. I connected with her faith at a time in my life where I was going through a trial and tribulation. Mm -hmm. But I connected with her and uh, it's, it's been, you know, I hear it every, ever since. I marvel at the faith that she had yeah, she did. Uh, and everything that she went through. So um, saying that, let me go back. You want to tell me again, Leona, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> so you actually answered that question. I actually just want to, yes, you did. I just wanted to know the relationship or you tell the audience the relationship between you, James, and your aunt Harriet. Okay. But that was a great story, right? 
I loved it. Okay, so we're going to go and start with our questions. So the first one is going to be, um, it says, based on research, I'm aware that Kasaya, James's mother, was like a sister to Harriet. And Harriet apparently is very family-oriented. What do you think made James special? She seemed protective of him. Why did she keep James? Well, you know, you, I, I think the reason why, first of all, is because Kasaya was like a sister to her. They were very close. And she also knew that being, I think she focused more on him. Uh, well, he was like, I think maybe like four years older than, because at the time it was just he and Araminta, his sister. Mm -hmm. And I think he's like four years or four to six years older than she. And so I think that probably um, she knew that he needed an education. She saw that how education was withheld from us. She could not read, she could not write. And she knew the importance of education. She knew the importance of as, 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 as him being a male what he would need going forward in life. So because they were in Philadelphia, uh, she felt that it would be better for him to be educated there, you know, than anywhere else. So um, she was able to get jobs because when she was in Philadelphia, she worked. But she worked uh, in order to earn money because it took money for her to go back and forth uh, to liberate uh, the family and friends. But she was also working to take care of James, you know, to in order to educate him and for his care and and his board as well. So she took half her pay that she would make, and it wasn't. Well, to, today, I mean, it was a dollar, whatever that transmits to today. Right. Uh, something around around that amount. And she took that and um, gave that for his education and his care. But I, I, I think that um, mostly she saw what slavery did. She saw what not having education did and, and and she is said to have said you know slavery is the worst thing next to hell oh wow so she knew what it was going to take for him to have a start in life and a better life and that's why i think she did it so do you happen to know where um she where james went to school no that's the one thing that we don't know we yeah we we don't <laughs> hasn't been found nor has a picture has it no not yet no picture I'm, I'm sure it's out there somewhere uh, maybe uh, but you know it hasn't been discovered yet okay so let's talk a little bit about James and what led him to South Carolina okay well let me say let me go, let me go back a little bit. <laughs> When you talked about, because I, I, I don't know if I heard you right when you said the date. Okay. That, okay. Because in 1850, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they were on the block. Kasaya, James, and Araminta. Yes, ma'am. And Aunt Harriet got word and went to Baltimore, met her husband, John, there. And they planned this escape. Aunt Harriet remained, but he went in, able to get her out under disguise, like you said. Uh, and and what happened also was that it just so happened they wanted to go to lunch. So that helped. <laughs> and so while that was happening, he took her and got into a boat because, you know, John was a shipbuilder and... Uh, I think he was a blacksmith as well. That was the father. So, you know, he, he, he knew a lot about boats. He was on the water a lot. And so he, you know, took her up to Baltimore. And then, 
because it was the 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Act, they um, went to Canada and, uh, and, and resided there. But when all that occurred, uh, he was more like, I think you said you. I think you said. Did you say six? Yes. Yes. It. I, I have six. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you see him there, and then they go to Canada, but he stays with Aunt Harriet in Philadelphia. Right. And then his parents leave Canada mm -hmm. uh, in 1865 to come back to Auburn. But he goes to Canada and he's seen on the census there in, in Chatham, um, uh, Ontario, Ontario, um, in the 1861 census. And it says he's, I think it says he's 17. So that's how, that's, that's uh, his age uh, at that time. So you know, he leaves there with his family and they come back to Auburn. But during that time, like he goes in, when the war starts, uh, he goes into the Navy and he does, you know, uh, what he does there. But his other brother, Harkless, stays behind when his family moves to back to Dorchester County, where they were on the block so that he could be educated in Maryland. And so he goes, after the war, James leaves and goes back and goes to South Carolina, Georgetown, South Carolina, where he becomes a teacher in the uh, Freedmen schools. So did I answer the question or did I go all over the place? Because <laughs> sometimes I get involved in what I'm saying and I don't even answer the question. So I, I guess, I, I mean, we really are saying the same thing. I guess I wondered why, why South Carolina? Like, especially why Georgetown? Like, what made us different? Why didn't he go back to Dorchester? Or, you know, why didn't he go to another state? Well, see, for them, Dorchester, even though it was horrible, her mother, her father was still there. And so, you know, they wanted to go back there to make that their home. So that's why they went back. And besides, you know, it, uh, 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 it happened in what, 1865. So they felt safe to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's why they went. And in terms of James, um, He went to, I think, you know, probably in the, in the Navy, he was probably in South Carolina somewhere, maybe, I don't know. And, you know, one of the coast, cause he had to be in one of the coastal towns in order to be in the Navy. Um, but why he chose Georgetown, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. It could have been that that is where the need was. Mm -hmm. um, how far is uh, Buford, South Carolina from Georgetown? Uh, about two hours. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's where everything was happening. That's where everything started. That's where Aunt Harriet was and, um, and doing everything in that area. So the, 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 the Carolinas... Uh, were really important in that in that in, in that realm, but you know he wanted to go back. He wanted to go there and be a teacher because he felt the need to give back. Um, and in his words, he says to assist in the regeneration of his people. So I think he looked at and was inspired a lot by Aunt Harriet and what she did. Also, what he was seeing when he was in the Navy and what was needed. So the need was greater 
in the southern states mm -hmm. because that's where the masses of of enslaved people were being freed at the time mm -hmm. on those plantations along 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 in, in that area so they were still there uh trying to you know find a way to live and so that's where I think that's where the need was. So I think that's probably why he chose that area. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so you really kind of hit on my next question, talking about him um, being a teacher. And ultimately, he definitely was deemed the commissioner of the schools. And so we're definitely appreciative of that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Freedmen's Fairs? Yes. Um, I don't know how much everybody knows about, um, about the Freedmen's Bureau and how that all got started. Um, but there, like I said, there was a need and, um, the government intended to help the enslaved people to be able to find a way to live, to supply them with food and clothes, uh, places to live, help them get a start in life in terms of helping them negotiate contracts and all those different kinds of things. And eventually, the head of it was by uh, the head of it became uh, General Howard um, over that over the Freedmen's Bureau, <laughs> and the Freedmen's Bureau lasted from 1865 to 1872. When the when the, when when the end of the war came, most of the plantation owners. Flee, fled and left the enslaved people. A lot of them were still there. So that was one of the bureau's um, aspiration is to give them a place to live, land. And the land that they were giving them was the land that they were living on, the plantation. Um, and along with that, like I said, food and providing all those kinds of things. But what happened was they were running short of funds. So when he came down to Georgetown and was teaching, as a lot of other teachers from the North came and Aunt Harriet was also one that participated before she left there uh, in the Freedmen's Bureau, uh, but in a different capacity. Um, they discovered about the lack of funds that what was still needed, what wasn't happening. And so what Aunt Harriet would do, she would go back up north and as she always did for the people that she was liberating before the Civil War, she would ask for funds, ask people to help. And, you know, give her money to help them. And she would take that money, never put it for herself, but always for who had need. And she began to have what they call these fairs to raise funds, to raise money in order to send clothes, food, and uh, all the other things that they would need down in the, in the Southern states for the people that have been newly freed. And what they would do is they would make 
the people up north would make things that they could sell. And they would have a day of selling them. They would have a day where people could come in and eat, and buy, you know, buy, purchase food and eat and all those kinds of things. So that was what uh, the fair was about. And James came back um, a second time when he, when he was in need uh, for that. And she had another Freedmen's Fair to raise funds. Uh, for the for the uh, for the people down there, so that's what the fair was all about. Thank you, and I find it amazing that even teachers back in eighteen plus eighteen hundred plus were raising money for students and people. Okay, <laughs> all right. Uh, buying, putting, buying things and doing things because I was a teacher. Uh -huh. <laughs> out of your own pocket, right? Right. You right. want the man, yeah. Man, okay, so um, after his success in education, Mr. Bowley was not done, nor did he rest on his laurels. What do you think led him to go to law school or um, even anything about his career in law? Okay, well, you gotta understand what was going on in the world at that time. Um, through his own education, he could see, I mean, the world just opened up to him. And he could see so many things. Plus he had Aunt Harriet there by his side teaching him things. But you have to understand also what was happening. He essentially was working in the benefit of the Reconstruction era, which was approximately, what, 1865 and ended, I think, in 72, I think, or was it 67? No, 77, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, but during that time, you had many things that were happening. Okay, you began with the 13th Amendment, that gave us freedom. But a part of that 13th Amendment, you had the exceptions clause. And the exceptions clause said that we could not be enslaved except for punishment of a crime. Whoa, that was the loophole right there. Mm -hmm to be able for, this was a federal law, and but that was a loophole for the states to come in and still continue slavery mm -hmm. under another name. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we are fighting today mm -hmm. and that there are some states that are making a new law, taking that out, take, you know, saying, no, we're not going by that because that's what's happening in a lot of our prisons today, where they are doing that and using prisoners for uh, essentially for enslavement. See, there's not anything wrong with against people. If you if you if something happens, you need to be in prison for prisons, but it's how you use them. And, and, and how you go about using them uh, and you, how things you set up things in order for you to get that to be used. So um, that was happening then. Because of that, they were able to take the states now, we're talking about the states, because the Southern, the Southern states that rebelled and, and, and left the Union, they were now coming back into the union. And they didn't like the fact that we were given freedom, let alone starting to get other things that were happening for us. And so they took the slave codes, made them, transfer them into what you call black codes. And the black codes were 
a way to restrict the freedom and the rights of newly freed African Americans. So that was just calling us in being enslaving us in a in in in, in a modern day slavery then under another name because they controlled everything you did where you worked how you worked how you traveled in the same way that it was happening and occurring in slavery in louisiana you had to have a permit just to go to leave your job you had to have a permit after a certain time to be on the street you had to have this in writing from your employer and from other people, like you are not your own person and in charge of your own body anymore. So this was happening. Each state was changing it and molding it to what they needed and what they wanted. But essentially it was all the same, operating from the black codes, restricting black people in doing what they were doing. And also, uh, uh, using it by saying, if you uh, don't work, they presented a contract with you, to you. If you don't sign that contract, you're committing vagrancy and, and you're loitering. We can put you in jail. If you don't, if you decide once you start working, no, this is not right. I don't want that anymore. And you stop, they can get you for loitering, vagrancy put you in jail. And then they could also take your children and do the same thing. So those were the black codes. That was going on. And at the same time, you had the 14th Amendment came in, 1868, giving you citizenship as African Americans. Cannot deny citizenship to us as, as uh, uh, natural, born, or uh, uh, former enslaved, we were granted full citizenship. And then you had the 18th and the 15th Amendment giving the men the right to vote. African-American men, former enslaved, the right to vote. And it could not be denied that right to vote because they were enslaved or because of race, or for any other reason. Even if you went to prison, you, according to the Constitution, you cannot be denied your right to vote. So that was uh, uh, the atmosphere going on during that time that was preparing a certain ground for the development of everything that you're seeing right now. So James is right at the beginning of Reconstruction. Reconstruction when the world was opening up to African Americans. He knew that you had the right to vote, you could vote. So African Americans could vote the way they wanted to, but the hope was they would start voting and bringing in some of African-Americans into uh, the areas that make policy and create uh, other things that are good for African-Americans. Having ownership uh, of, of land and being able to start businesses. So he's seeing all of this, plus, <clears throat> He was able to see by being around on Harriet, around her people that she uh, 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 dealt with, a lot of the abolitionists, the anti-slavers and things like that and their meetings and the things that they did and what they talked about. So he was seeing the politics that was occurring. And so I think that because of that, he decided 
the way to be able to have impact was to actually take advantage of that, become in a position in administration that could um, cause change on that level also, in order for him to even have greater power and greater impact, he became a lawyer. I think that's the reason why he did it. <laughs> so that he could enter politics in order to make the change that he wanted to see. Because he started on the level of teaching, actually coming in teaching children the same way he was taught what to know, what to expect, what to aspire to. And that grew in him. And, and so it allowed him to be able to do these other things in, 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 in his life. So it all worked together to bring him to where he was in life at that time. Okay. Thank you. Be the change you want to see, right, in the world. Um, so we are going to have to take a pause. I'm going to ask one more thing or allow you some space for one more thing, and then I want to think we have time for question and answer, correct? Um, so before we do question and answer, uh, I just wanted to let you or allow you the space to kind of talk about your life's mission and preservation of work, your work, in reference to your Aunt Harriet and James, I know you're working hard to try to make sure that that happens. If you wanted to share anything with the crowd. You want me to do that now? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Um, well, like I said that, um, you know, I connected with Aunt Harriet uh, where it was more than just, oh, you know, she's my relative and things like that where I was really inspired by her uh, later in my life. Uh, when I was younger, you know, I always knew about her from the time I could remember hearing. And, and I shared it one time when we were in school and I wasn't believed. So that was when I said, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling anyone else anymore. So, as I grew older and I got into high school, you know, when I was in high school, that was that was during civil rights and the black power movement, you know, where we became, you know, embraced our heritage and proud of where we came from. And also seeing that we had rights and we wanted to uh, fight for those rights. So in our high school, and my high school was predominantly uh, made up of Polish and Italians. And they all had groups of their own, you know, different things. And so the black population, we didn't have anything. And we saw that. We said, mm, we, don't, we don't really have a group representing us. So we started this group called Umoja. And it was about celebrating our culture, our heritage. And, and we met, you know, just like all the other groups met and we were thinking, okay, what are the ways that we can bring in this positive that, we'll, uh, that we could share with other people and let them see and learn. But then we realized, hmm, we don't have, our education is not being taught to us. African-American history is not being taught in our schools. So why aren't we seeing any of that? When we took American history or world history, that wasn't talked about. So we knew that we were missing in the books and in the education. So as a group, we decided that we would fight for our history to be taught as a part of our choice of curriculum in the school. Also, Black literature was another one that we fought for. 
And we decided that we would have, we would go to them, ask them, this is what we want. And if they didn't, if, if, if we didn't get it, okay, we would boycott. And that meant we would just have a walkout. And we didn't get it. So we decided on a certain day we were going to walk out. Now, my parents were ones that said education was everything. Education was your way. Your education was your way out. Education was something that no one else could take from you because it's in your mind. So they didn't tolerate playing hooky and all that kind of stuff, skipping school. So that day we walked out and I came home early. My mom was home and she wanted to know why was I home in the afternoon when I should have been in school. And I told her why. So she said, well, okay. She understood, but she said, okay, this one time, and this one time only. But then we went back to school and we were told then that we would now have African-American history as a part of our education, as a choice, and also Black literature. Because we were being taught African-American history in our homes, in our churches, and in our communities, I didn't feel I needed that because I knew a lot of it already. And so I didn't choose African-American history, but I did choose Black literature which I thoroughly enjoy. Um, my homeroom teacher, I told you that I never shared it with anybody, but she was the one that taught African-American history. And as I was scurrying out of my classroom to get to my next class to be on time, she stopped me and said, Ernestine, I need to speak to you for a minute. And I was kind of like, irritated a little bit because I said, I got to get to class. I didn't say that to her, but that's what I was thinking. I got to get to class. I can't be late. And so she asked me, she said, is it true that you're a descendant of Harriet Tubman? And because I was a teenager, I just stood there looking at her with a blank look on my face like, huh? And all I said was, yes. And then I ran off. I wish I had asked her, how'd you know that? Where did you get that from? I didn't talk about that with anybody else. But then I move on into, you know, into the, you know, further going into the 70s and things like that and what was happening then. Um, doing my own life. And I chose, you know, I'm an artist. I went to art school for a year, for, you know, at UB and decided, oh, you know, uh, I don't know if I want to pursue that anymore. And I decided I wanted to go into nursing. Nursing had always been, uh, you know, taking care of people, watching over people, helping them, uplifting them has always been something that I did in my life from the time I was young. So that was a natural next step for me. Not associating it with Aunt Harriet her doing that and that coming down through my maternal line of helping others. I watched my mother help others. She wasn't a nurse, but she always helped others. She and my father. And so I, you know, that was just like, I guess, inbred in me. So I did that. Then I went back to art school, went to a University of Maryland, finished out in art, did many, many, many years of nursing. Um, but I found out that still something, I, there was something more than I needed. And then through a trial and tribulation that I was going through with my health and everything, I connected with Aunt Harriet again with her faith with her strength and and that was at a time when they were starting getting ready to getting they got money in Cambridge in Maryland the state was giving them a lot of money to try to um, build this center for in her honor 
Which if you haven't been there, go. Hurry up and go. It's beautiful. And I became a part of that group in that planning of that. They asked if any family members wanted to be a part. And I said, yeah, I do. I do. And that opened and it's just a beautiful place. It's so it's untouched to a great extent to how it was when she was there, living there. And that is one of the reasons also why she was so, could do what she did in, in Beaufort because the landscape were so similar. The landscape in Beaufort and the landscape in Dorchester County in that area, very similar, looked the same. And she knew how to navigate that space, that land, the, the, the swampy areas and all those things. Um, but, you know, it, it just became more and more where I became more in touch with her and needed to be able to share that with people, to talk about her, to talk about her faith. Um, and so as a part of that, I realized, you know, everybody knows about her liberation, about her liberating her family and friends, but not many people understood about the Civil War and her participation there, why she was there, how she got there, the reason she got there, what she did while she was there, what she did afterwards. And so that became my mission, along with letting people know about her faith and how that all worked and how we could all have the same thing. My mission also was to tell people about her service in the Civil War and to make sure, to try to make sure in every area that I can see that she be recognized for what she did because she wasn't being recognized. She got a pension. She submitted an application for her pension and she was denied and she made the application as a spy and a scout, which is what she was. So it was my mission to celebrate that, to make it known. And I became co-founder of Harriet Tubman Day, Washington, DC, because in, across the nation, they were starting in many states to have Harriet Tubman Day in their states or their cities, because George Bush, the senior George Bush, I think it was in 93, made the proclamation of Harriet Tubman Day on the date of her death. And it was done that way because they didn't know her birthday. So in hopes that across the nation, you have everybody celebrating this, Harriet Tubman Days in their states and their cities, that maybe we would get a holiday at some point recognizing her. But I wanted my city that I live in now to celebrate her, to understand what she did for this country. Because what we see as our, as our country today, she played a big part at her own peril because she could have been taken back into slavery. But you see the union we have today partly because of her participation. And I wanted to make that known. And then in, Jan in June of this past year, of 2021, I went down, my husband and I, to Fort Huachuca, to the United States Military Intelligence Base Hall of Fame, and she was inducted as a full member. And there's a story behind that. <laughs> but she was inducted at this time not as an honorary, but as a full member. And they recognize her as a spy and a scout. So for them to say that, I feel like that vindicates them denying her her pension. 
based upon the fact that she was a spy and a scout. So where I am now today with that is continuing on promoting her legacy. And I'm getting ready to start a foundation where that will happen. And I can just follow her legacy of helping other people in their immediate needs. Because what has what COVID-19 has taught us is that there are many people that are in need and many people that need help in being lifted up. Um, and we have to have that thing that she had, which was love, which was faith, and she was selfless. She did not put herself in the center. She put everybody else in the center. And she did that from the time she first liberated herself until she died. So that's where my life is right now. Thank you so, so much. I wish you much success in you continuing your life's work. I did want to recognize Ms. McQueen. She's here now. They, um, I don't, can she see, can you see her? <laughs> uh, and Mr. Willie is back in your hands. He's coming forward and is gonna wrap us up. Well, I wanna thank, this has been a wonderful presentation and appreciate so much, Joy, thank you. And Tina, I'll stand in front so you can see. I wanna thank you very, very much. I feel like all of us now can call her Aunt Harriet and Uncle James. <laughs> if we look at it as a title of respect, that's indeed the case. I mean, incredible lives of two incredible people um, that become a part of the Georgetown history, which is just, it's so neat. What a wonderful place to live. Ah, thank you, now I can talk. <laughs> But Tina, thank you so very much for sharing your, your time, more importantly, your heart and passion. And that's very, very special. And, and Joy, for your research and your heart and passion, I thank you very much as well. What a great, great presentation. I uh, just want to encourage you um, to continue to participate in the events here at the library. Oh, I, I went back up, back up, back up. Steve, thank you. And the book is available at? <laughs> well, you can, you can get it online, or if you live in Georgetown, you can get it from me, or in the library has a few copies. And I think the bookstore downtown, I think I've seen some copies. Several of the bookstores downtown. Yeah. Down yeah. Also, on the workbook, it's been colorized, so there's a newer version. And, and that Gullah part at the end is neat, because you have not only the English, but you've got the Gullah. And I, I love that combination. It's a wonderful way to be able to understand, again, another part of our culture and our, our uh, society here in Georgetown, so it's neat. And Kent? Yes. Nice to have, Kent is here. Kent currently lives, you want to talk a little bit? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm the, I currently own the Bully House and was responsible for the renovation of it and worked with Steve and Marilyn for the, on the historical market. Marilyn Hemingway, so thank you to both. Of that's such a neat part of our, so we have, this is great. Thank you for being here and making the connection with Tina and allowing us to be able to do that. When you came in or if you, as you're going out, pick up a copy of, I th thought it'd be helpful with what's the remainder of our winter and spring schedule with the Friends of the Georgetown Library. One of which is coming up this coming Friday. I would encourage you to come uh, for a couple reasons. It's a special children and adult program, Bright Star Theater production of George Washington Carver and Friends. It'll be right here. Um, there's a real wonderful children's program um, that Sheila here at the library puts together and so forth. Uh, and it's one of the reasons we have the Friends of the Library to financially support those programs. And this is one of the programs. So one of the reasons to come is see where does your donations, your membership go? Uh, in the production of these programs. But the second part is, it's a really good program and it's not just for kids. So if you have children, grandchildren, bring them, but at the same time, come on Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon for that. One week from today uh, is our annual friends meeting in which we get together and uh, we sort of have to do the business part of it. 
It's, it's important to do that once a year to be able to have accountability with the election of officers, a financial report. We are making some changes in our bylaws and uh, it's important changes. And so we like to have a good turnout for that next Tuesday afternoon at 4.30 to 6 o'clock. But we always do sort of the, let, how do we encourage people to come? And I need to go over here for just a moment. Um, a brand new, literally brand new book has just come out by one of the Clemson staff working over at Hobcall called Flowering Plants of Hobcall Barony. And uh, Maureen Mulligan, who is one of the authors of this along with uh, uh, William Connor, is going to be here to do a presentation on the wildflowers that grow, which would be obviously not just at Hobcall, but throughout this area of the low country. So excellent. So that's sort of our bribery to get you here for the business meeting. You see what's involved there, but anyway. So I hope you'll come. Copies of the book will be available, and uh, Maureen will be signing those, and just to be able to have a wonderful presentation and appreciate your support for the Friends of the Library. And then our next Tuesdays With program. It's always the third Tuesday of the month, so 15th of February, and because March mirrors it, March 15th at 10 o'clock, we're going to be having Bud Hill and um, Billy Baldwin, many people know them, McClellanville area, great speakers, uh, poets, photographers, historians, just really interesting people. And uh, they'll be here on Tuesday, March 15th, speaking on Francis Benjamin Johnson who during the Depression came to South Carolina under U.S. support, U.S. government support, to take photographs to understand what was happening in the South. And there's a collection of 600 photographs that are in the National Archives. And Billy and uh, Bud have taken those and summarized them in a brand new book. And we're the first place where they're going to do a presentation uh, on their new book that's coming out. So I hope you'll be able to join us on March 15th, Francis Benjamin Johnson's Carolina. And then we have a community yard sale coming up. Uh, whether you would like to get rid of stuff, this is one of the things COVID's allowed us to do is clean out all those boxes in our attics and everything else. Uh, we had one in the fall and we got about an hour and a half into it when the rain came. So we thought we'll do a spring one. And so this is a, a spring yard sale. If you have, it's easy, $15, $20 to have a space in the parking lot behind the library. But if not, come and buy. Uh, a lot of people, we've already have quite a few who have signed up for that. And then um, we're going to have Georgetown Gators of Winyaw High School, a brand new, another new book that's just come out, The History of the Football Team at Winyaw High School. And we're going to have a presentation, reception, book signing on March 24th. Then we have a living history performance. We have a lot of cool things happening. Uh, Edith Russell, Titanic survivor on April 8th. Our April Tuesdays with is beekeeping in the low country. There's something you got to learn about. And finally, uh, on May 17th, Lee Brockington is going to be coming and speaking on the Grimke sisters, South Carolina women who worked toward abolition. So we got a good schedule. Pick it up and uh, hope we'll see you on Friday as well. Again, thank you so very much, Tina. And You're thank welcome. you. Thank you, Joy. God bless you all. Thank you.